Network robotics is the discipline that studies how electromechanical systems endow with a certain degree of autonomy. Robots interact with each other in order to achieve a common objective. Why should we care about robots interacting with each other in order to achieve a common objective? How do we even begin to formalize a problem describing robots interacting with one another? What are the kind of algorithms we can use to let robots interact with one another? And finally, what can we do with robots interacting with each other? What kind of real-world problems can we solve by having team of robots working together? This and more coming up on Network Robotics. Hi, welcome to this series of episodes on Network Robotics. My name is Pietro Pierpaoli. I am a postdoctoral fellow at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering here at Georgia Tech. Together with students, other postdocs, and professors here at Georgia Tech, we are going to explore the magic world of network robotics. Over the course of the next episodes, we are going to motivate, first of all, why do we care about robots interacting with one another? Then we are going to introduce and describe the tools that we need to formally describe the problem of robots interacting with each other. And finally, we are going to describe algorithms to be deployed on real robots here at the Robotarium. Are you ready? Let's get started. Before getting started, we should set up a little bit the boundaries of our discussion, for example, introducing some definitions. In doing so, I would like you to keep in mind that the definitions that we are going to introduce are not to be thought of as unique, but rather as stepping stones on top of which we are going to build our discussion. First of all, what is a network system? We will refer to a network system as a collection of interacting individuals that somehow share information with each other. For example, a person walking the dog is a very simple representation of a network system. The dog and the person are both individuals, each with their own characteristics way of moving, which we refer to as their dynamics, and interact by applying forces to a leash. Extending from our first definition, we can also introduce the idea of collaboration in a group of individuals. We say that a collaborating group is a network of individuals taking actions and sharing information in order to achieve a common objective. There are an incredible amount of examples we can find in nature where individuals of a species, but also individuals from different species, interact with each other in order to, for example, find a nesting location, fetch food, defend from predators, and more. In the definitions we just introduced, there are two central concepts that we are going to encounter throughout the entire episodes of this series. The first one is the existence of a common objective between the individuals of a group. The second one is the existence of a flow of information between them. Generally speaking, this objective can have different forms and be subject to different types of constraints. In general, representing an objective given a problem is not necessarily always an easy and straightforward process. In addition, the representation of a team's objective could be more or less abstract. For example, we could use a well-defined mathematical function such as x squared plus 42 to describe the objective of a certain problem. This is commonly found in those frameworks that model problems through some form of optimization process. Alternatively, the objective could be in the form of a logical statement. For example, the individuals of a team should stay close together while avoiding direct exposure to the sunlight and eventually reach a certain destination. Or a team's objective could also be represented by a temporal sequence of rewards or penalties the individuals collect over time by taking certain actions and by changing somehow the environment around them. This is usually the framework in reinforcement learning problems. The second fundamental concept that we introduced earlier is the flow of information between individuals. We are going to spend an entire episode just on this fact, introducing the mathematical tools that we need to describe this portion of the problem. However, we can introduce a few key ideas. For example, if we think about a room full of people all speaking the same language, we can imagine that everybody has the ability to speak with anybody else. On the other side, there could be a more constrained situation in which an individual is only allowed to speak with a subset of the population or maybe with no one at all. As we will see, the flow of information between individuals is the single most important factor in network robotics and also what makes it special. Related to the idea of collaboration, we will often encounter the concept of coordination. One way of defining coordination is to say that it's a form of collaboration that predominantly manifests itself through the movement of the individuals. This is, for example, the case of the collaboration happening between players of a football team, or between dancers performing on a stage, 
or within a flock of birds moving in the sky. One question now one could ask is, why do we care about coordination in team of robots? Well, motion problems are a big part of robotics. This is the case, for example, if you think about big industrial manipulators, about autonomous vehicles or aerial drones. Now, if we take uh, individuals from these groups and we put together in team, where well, they need to collaborate. For example, a team made of uh, mobile manipulators tasked with moving a large object. Now, designing the strategy for each one of these robots to move so that its own motion is going to be effective for the entire objective of the collectivity becomes a central problem. The second reason why we are interested in a coordination in team of robots, it's because the algorithms that we use to solve motion control problems in group of robots are actually the same algorithms that we can use to solve related problems. If, for example, we replace position and velocity with another quantities of interest. For example, if we consider a team of firefighting quadcopters, as we will see, the same algorithms that we can use to move them collectively to a location of a fire, for example, is the same kind of algorithm we can use to let them decide who is actually going to extinguish the fire and who is going to maybe save the battery for some other tasks. At this point, there is still one question that we need to answer before moving forward. Why is collaboration between robots so interesting and what can we do with it? Collaboration in robot teams is useful for a number of very practical engineering reasons. For instance, you get a bigger spatial footprint. If you want to go out with a robotic search and rescue robot after an earthquake to, let's say, find a missing puppy, if you send one robot out, uh, that robot may or may not be successful. If you send out 100 robots, well, you can cover the area much more effectively. Uh, similarly, Let's say I want to have a robot go get me a cup of coffee, and if that robot falls down a flight of stairs, then I don't get coffee. But if I can send out 100 robots, then perhaps I get 90 cups of coffee instead. So not only do you cover more area, you also build in robustness and redundancy to malfunctioning or faulty robots. A third engineering reason, really, is you can also build in heterogeneity. Let's say you have one robot that's really good at finding heat sources where the coffee is. You have another robot that can carry the, the coffee, say, and then you have maybe a third robot that's an elegant server robot. So, so you can really distribute capabilities across the robot team in, a, in, a, in an effective way. But to be honest, those are all practical reasons why I think collaborating, collaborating robots uh, is particularly exciting. It's really a scientific question, you know. Nature is filled of beautiful, mesmerizing examples of collective, collaborative organisms. All the way from schooling fish and flocking birds to ant colonies to, to even our own body where cells are collaborating and communicating with each other in a rather coordinated and effective way. The reason why multi-agent robotics is more challenging than their single agent counterpart is really First of all, you have to come up with algorithms that are local in the sense that the individual robots only act on the information they have available to them. They also have to be scalable in the sense that as an individual actor or robot or agent, I cannot have to worry about the state of everyone or have to really worry about how many agents there are in the network because that can easily get overwhelmed. And all of a sudden we have an algorithm that does not scale gracefully in the number of agents. Another thing that needs to happen is of course, emergent phenomena have to appear in a provably correct way, meaning we actually know what globally we're getting out from these local interactions. And then the fourth thing is we have to do this all the while making sure that things are safe. If I am implementing, let's say, a collaborative multi-agent algorithm for a platoon of vehicles on a highway, and you know what? Eh, they work most of the time, every now and then they collide. That is not a good algorithm. So we got to make sure that the robots are also reacting quickly to things going on around them and respond in a safe and orderly manner. When we think about the algorithms that will move our collaborating teams of robots, there are four key questions we should always ask during our design and evaluation process. First, is our algorithm local? With the word local, we intend to say that the algorithm can actually run on the information available in the sense of measurable to the robots. Or stated slightly differently, what does a robot need to know to run the algorithm? The second question is the following. Is our algorithm scalable? Meaning, can it run with the same level of performance when deployed on 10, 100, 1000 robots? Third, 
is our algorithm safe? A number of different aspects can fall within safety considerations. For example, are the robots going to avoid collisions with other robots and external objects? Are the communication channels between the robots reliable and secure? Finally, is our algorithm decentralized? Does it require a central authority dispatching instruction to the robots and supervising their operations? As mentioned before, this last property is what makes network robotics really attractive. In fact, when a central control unit supervising all robots is in place, it represents a single point of failure. In addition, when dealing with large teams of robots, the communication overhead of one too many communication structures might not even be feasible at all in practice. In summary, in today's episode, we introduced some important definitions and we motivated why the problem of network robotics is interesting. Starting next time, we are going to describe our first algorithms and deploy that on our robots here at the Robotarium. See you next time.